numbers might have shown that little kids read and have the brain and how it changes and grows in response to challenge, they're much more likely to persevere when they fail because they don't believe that failure is a permanent condition. So growth mindset is a great idea for building grit, but we need more. And that's where I get in my remarks because that's where we are. That's the work that stands before us. We need to take our best ideas, our strongest intuition, and we need to test them. We need to measure whether we've been successful, and we have to be willing to fail, to be wrong, to start over again with lessons learned. In other words, we need to be gritty about getting our kids grittier. Good morning, everybody. I uh, just wanted to start today with a video. And the reason was uh, essentially that I feel uh, grittiness is a great predictor of performance uh, above and beyond any HR process. Uh, Angela Duckworth, who you just did the, uh, saw the video from TEDx, you can definitely look her up on TEDx. I put the uh, link in the chat for anyone who's interested. She also wrote a book on grit, which includes an interesting survey. She was able to predict performance um, in multiple industries and even in the military for, for places like uh, West Point, for example. Uh, there's two other books I think that are really useful in this area, Surrounded by Idiots, which is based on the DISC profile that Thomas Erickson's father, I believe, um, created, uh, which is a great way to understand people. Uh, and it's in multiple languages if you don't speak English. And then one strictly from my, I guess, sales bent, which is the 80-20 principle. This is the uh, most updated version. But uh, good morning, everybody. We're now at 8.06, so I thought we would go ahead and start um, with, oops. First of all, a special thank you to Rick Gregson and Brandon Sancioni um, for starting Auto Hub. Rick has uh, decided to move on, just so that you know, and Brandon has, has an $8 million building to uh, pay for, so he's focused on that. Uh, we're introducing today our, our new speaker, our new co-host, and that's Jeff Polo. Uh, having some technical challenges here. Hello, everybody. Hello, Jeff. Just give me one second here. I have this. So there we go. So Jeff Polo is our new co-host. I've known Jeff for uh, a number of years. Uh, and Jeff has a lot of industry experience. Um, and uh, I just wanted uh, Jeff to introduce himself. So let me just go to that. Maybe this was gonna give me challenges. Well, I'll just sort of break the, uh, the awkward silence there. Hello, everybody, I'm glad to be here. As it says, my name's Jeff Polo, located here in sunny Vancouver, along with Ian. And uh, I'm really pleased to be here and uh, carry on the, uh, the, uh, what Brandon started and Rick continued with with Brandon and of course what Ian's building here too. I've been, uh, been in the business a long time, I will admit to 30 years and uh, my favorite line is, is uh, I entered the business at six. I'm a long time, a lifelong car guy and um, I always like to say I was born with oil in my, uh, in my veins. I've been uh, through every position in variable operations from uh, sales through business manager, through sales manager, uh, GSM, GM. And uh, I certainly feel that uh, I have a, can bring a lot to the, uh, to the platform here. I've worked with dealer groups, with uh, individual single point stores, and um, have a very lucky position of knowing really how the things work differently. Um, it's, uh, it's fun to be here. I think Ian's a pretty cool guy and definitely, uh, definitely the, the technical brains of the operation. And, um, I think this is a terrific platform for people from all over to, to get together and, and to just pick up on things. And the beauty I like of this platform is the fact that it's not a sales platform, which you will see in one of the slides later on. And it's a place for people who've done well at what they've done can share ideas without 
judgment without uh, anybody thinking that uh, by me or anything else. So uh, frankly, I'm quite excited to be here and uh, very much looking forward to it. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so housekeeping items for Auto Hub. This is our meeting, not my meeting or Jeff's meeting. Please mute or unmute yourself. Click raise your hand and we'll be, ha and be happy to call on you. I'm going to be moderating the chat box and doing everything behind the scenes. Uh, there's a wealth of knowledge on the call, so let's share ideas and respect each other's time. We ask on Auto Hub participants to be open to sharing ideas and be okay with others using them. Absolutely no selling, please. Open discussions with a focus on improving business. We value your input, speak up, bring value, brainstorm ideas, ask questions. Be respectful for everyone's time. We are all busy professionals. Stay on topic, challenge our speakers, bring value and content that can help you. Vendor Speak is on Fridays. Uh, visit autohubclub.com for more details on past sessions. We will be adding recordings in the near future as presenters provide them. Uh, vendor speak is open to all past auto hub speakers reach out to me to coordinate scheduling and discuss best practices for vendor speak sessions i can help you get more people in those sessions and more importantly give you feedback as well uh, also we're always interested in listening to auto hub members to make everything better be it the monday sessions or the friday sessions <clears throat> week 13 automotive human resources part two we have two speakers we have paul Yakovatsi, I hope I pronounced that uh, right, from the Auto Trainer, and we have Sandy Zanil back from beautiful Florida to talk more about uh, HR and best practices. Uh, and uh, I'm going to let Jeff go ahead and introduce Paul. Thanks, Ian. Well, I'd like to obviously introduce Paul Yakovatsi. Uh, Paul is a, a very interesting and unique individual in, in our business. Uh, Paul has been, uh, he's been in the car business a long time. Um, not as long as me as you can tell by the hairline, but um, he's, he's got a wealth of knowledge and a while back he decided to, he figured it was time that, uh, that, that a way to bring trained salespeople to dealerships and actually train them in, 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 in standard process, sales process, so that when they got to a dealership, they, uh, they weren't suddenly overwhelmed with this you know, oh my God, what do I do? And uh, of course, even though we're um, we're in a world where dealers do a lot of training in house, there's a lot missing, and sometimes there's still those people that just say, "Hey, here's a list, and go get it." So, without further ado, I'll introduce Paul. And uh, Paul, tell me a little bit, tell everybody else a little bit more that I haven't touched on. Oh, wonderful, Jeff. Well, thanks very much. The cool thing about this is Jeff actually was there right from the beginning with me. Uh, started selling cars back in 1988. And back in 1988, there was no training. Uh, I was shown the inventory. I was given some keys. Here's the deep plates, go to her. So a sink or swim, taking like a little baby, throwing him into a swimming pool, and either you got to the other side or you drowned. And sadly enough today, even though the training is better, we still have a little bit of a wild, wild west mentality. And a lot of the managers simply don't understand the importance of ongoing training. So seven years ago, I developed a program called the Auto Trainer. I spent 20 years in management. And I just felt seven years ago that we were really not helping some of the newer people coming into our industry. Because as you know, Jeff, back in the 80s, you didn't really hire someone unless they had experience. Unless you had really good sales experience or you had car sales experience, it was really tough to get into our business. Well, that's changing, of course. And seven years ago, I noticed the change. But one thing I did notice also was I didn't have time as a sales manager. I was stressed. It's all about the numbers. And I just simply didn't have time to train and coach and mentor the upcoming candidates. And so I came up with this light bulb idea and basically I twisted it a little bit to also understand that I could not only train these new people, but also get them placed through my connections. So it is now seven years later, I've trained 1200 people, 267 of them are top performers. And here's one of the concepts that I preach and I'm gonna actually give Blair Upton from Do It GM, if you know Blair, I'll give him credit for this cash. A K for knowledge, A for attitude, skills, 
S for skills and H for habits. So that we get to formulate a game plan to get these guys and girls from the ground up. So again, the fundamentals, the trail to the sale and sticking with the process. Terrific, terrific. And, and Paula, as you said, I've seen it hands on and I know how it works. And uh, would mm -hmm. you agree with me as well that you're seeing less of a turnover of these people that have come out of your program at dealerships versus other ways? Yes. Uh, what happens typically is they start slow. And the reason why they start slow is because they're not uh, trained at the beginning. Even though they've taken the training program, there's that little, they, they're on speed dial at the very beginning because there's so many things going on. The hardest problem they're facing is confidence, overcoming objections. You know, how do you deal with just looking? And so once they get over that little bubble and they start to understand that the, the same objections come every time. It's the same thing. Just looking, just looking around. I don't want to be, you know, hassled today. Well, if they get past that and get the customer away from the car and get the customer talking and build the rapport, the relationship, then they start to understand the importance of following through with the cycle. So I've trained... Uh, as I mentioned, 1,200 people, and I'm proud to share with you that most of the people I've trained are actually come from no sales background at all. I actually love hospitality background. Here's a young gentleman, Kurt Kamita, who took my program a year and a half ago, 19 years old. I don't even think he shaves there, Jeff. <laughs> and and uh, he came all the way from Chilliwack. Uh, for those of you guys know Derek Brown, uh, Derek Brown, paid for a Kurt's training. He drove from Chilliwack, which is an hour away from Vancouver every day to take my course. And back then I was doing it live. This gentleman sold 176 cars in his first year. And he's just rocking and rolling. And he fully understood the importance of following the sales cycle. Start off a little slow and they typically do five cars, so then six, so then seven. But once they get past the three month mark, then they start to really understand the importance of following through and they get hungry and they start making money. And that's where the ambition and the drive take over. Uh, the next person on there is Tiffany Kwiatkowski. Uh, Tiffany, uh, I love this young lady because she's very um, shy. She almost uh, didn't take my course because she didn't feel she had the confidence uh, I talked her into my program. I, I gave her a couple of days for free. I said, well, just sit in, see if you like it. And after two days, she was hooked on it. She is now one of the top performers with Subaru. And she won a contest. And I'm very proud of Tiffany. In her third month at Subaru, she won a six-point presentation contest, competing with guys and girls that were there 10 years. And all she did was go in there and just follow my six-point presentation, which was to interact with the customer engage the customer rather than go into the technical aspects of the car because a lot of these guys and girls get lost with too much information so tiffany kept it simple and did a five minute walk around and won a 500 dollars award for her presentation and the next person is my pride and joy my son roman so roman's been in the car business five years uh, again, Roman started slow and he's just one of these young fellows that was 19 at the time, but you can see those little stickers there, Jeff, not bad, eh? That, those stickers represent 22 stickers uh, in one month. Uh, he broke a record for Destination Mazda, so 155 cars in his third year, and now going into his fifth year, he's on his way and he's sold over 100 cars every year. And the wonderful thing with Roman is he's a great listener. He's not really big on talking. And by his biggest success, and I'm proud to share with you, 99.6%, ladies and gentlemen, on the CSI, Mazda Canada, number two in Western Canada, number one in all of Canada. So it's not just about selling. Well, I got a question from uh, one of our attendees. How sure. much? How much do you justify for a training budget in a dealership? I know training is important, but is there too much or too little of a budget? What's a good amount for a person or a dealership? It's from Melinda. Well, I've got, I noticed that John Latka is on there. Thanks, John, for joining. 
And so John and I have formed this wonderful relationship actually through LinkedIn. We're big on training. You know, that's probably the, one of the hardest things to understand is people don't understand the importance of investing in your people. And here's the biggest hurdle I think a lot of people have is I want to invest in my people, but then if they get too good, they'll leave, right? Oh, we're too busy. We don't need training. So they have to find this fine line at their dealership. And in the end, um, to me, training has to be an essential part because today, especially with COVID, yes, we're not going to hire as many people, but they're going to come back eventually. And when COVID opens, we all know, I think most of the dealerships are running with two or three less salespeople today because they don't need as many. But once COVID opens up and people start to come back, who are we going to get into our dealerships? Well, we're going to get new people. And that's where we have to start investing again. So uh, to me, it's, it's not an expense, it's an investment. And it has to be continuous, not just you know a, a one-shot deal. Because I know it's one thing with these new people, they need time. Right. So, so what kind of, uh, I guess, feedback are you hearing from the dealers that you work with or dealers in general about, um, you know, what they feel is a, is a, is a, obviously, you know, selling on the call, but what, what they feel is, is why they don't want to train people, for example. Why did, why they don't want to invest in their people yeah. or why they don't want to train? You know, a lot of them, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. And I won't mention this gentleman's name. He was in one of our dealership. He's now retired. And I went into the pitch my training. And he goes, Jacobazzi, why should I train these people? They're just going to get good and leave. And I told him, well, what if they get good and stay? What if they become assistant managers and then managers and then general managers? Why wouldn't you invest in your people and take that opportunity? So I ended up actually training two of his people. And one of them, Alex Wang, is still in the business. I think it's seven years later. Uh, he's selling actually high-end cars. And the other gentleman is Jerry Chen, who works at Company of Cars. Now, the other two fall, uh, fell away. So it's all up to them. You know, I always tell the story where I can train three people in a group. One will be fantastic. One will be average. And the other one will probably fail. You'll probably get a call on a DUI or MIA, missing in action. It happens, we can't control that. Our whole goal, I think, is to improve these people and constantly train. Because in the end, just because they've taken a training course and they're left alone, it's not gonna work. So uh, constant training is very important. And have a reason every day to do something with your staff to train. And I have another sort of comment from, um, from Asif. If they leave, that means you've trained them well to succeed and grow. If they say that means your training has also retained them, both have a positive. So that, that's a, just a really good uh, endorsement from Asif Frenji, who's on the mm. call. He, he's from Okotoks. Right. Uh, and I think Jeff had a few questions too for, for Paul. I certainly sure. do. Um, one thing that was said in there too, that uh, there's this cliche that says, uh, you know, like you mentioned, we train them and what if they leave? Well, what if you don't train them? You yeah, right. don't leave anyway. So yeah, that's and if right. Happy, or what, happy people. Or, or Jeff, even worse. Sorry. What if we they don't train and they stay? That's Isn't true. that even worse? Right. So Paul, it was uh, you mentioned something there. Is uh, now with COVID, everything's different. Perfect segue into this is uh, how can we bring in new new hiring practices during COVID? Okay. Well, I created a really cool concept years ago called a career fair. And what I do is I would work hand in hand with dealerships that are looking to hire. So for example, if a dealership is, you know, I typically with groups that are big, but I've done it with small stores too. If they need two or three people, and actually I did it with Brandon years ago at Murray Honda when he was manager there. And so what they needed were three people. So I got together a career fair idea. And what I did was I basically advertised on behalf of the dealership. I did a, a career opportunity. I met all these candidates for an hour. After meeting them for an hour, they got five minutes of fame to kind of sell themselves. So the managers left uh, the meeting, basically called these people back and did a one-on-one -on -one interview. And it was very, very successful. Now, the same problem though, you, you hire three, 
One's going to be great. One's going to be average. And that third person, that's where the sticking power, you know, they are usually a little bit slower to understand it, even though they've been trained the same. And some of them just don't have the driver ambition or the three month hurdle we talk about, the sticking power to stay. I've now changed it because of COVID and I'm actually doing this program with a Zoom. So it's wonderful because we can now use Zoom as a platform to train and to hire. And it's the same idea. What I do basically is to create a career idea, career fair, so people can come on a Zoom. We can actually meet them through Zoom, explain the auto industry to them. And what I do basically in this career day is just explain to people the wonderful benefits of the auto industry. Because a lot of people still think, you know, it's a hard business and you've got to be aggressive. You've got to always be closing. Where I teach them the opposite. I say, you don't have to be ABC, always be closing. It's all about NBC today, non-business conversation. So that people coming into our industry don't need to be a, a top salesperson from another industry. They can start off at the ground running. And I always compare it to an apprentice, right? So that they start slow, just like a good apprentice. They, you know, they start off with an oil and lube and they work their way into transmissions and brakes. Well, it takes four years, in my opinion, to become a sales professional. So we're looking at this wonderful picture of young Roman who's on his way, but it's getting past the three months. So this career day Zoom idea is, is a wonderful, effective way to bring new people into our business and to also educate them about our business because they still think, Jeff, we walk around with white pants, white shirt, and a toothpick in our mouth trying to close sales, right? There's still a little bit of that still lingering from the 70s and 80s. And you were there and I was there in the 80s. So we all know, right? So I wasn't there in the 70s. But you were there in the 80s. <laughs> so yeah. Paul and also I think John was, right, John? <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> well, as uh, young looking as I am, the fact of the matter is, yes, I was in it in the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, the, a very interesting uh, how you entered, entered into this. What do you think are the best ways to educate potential candidates? Because we talked about hiring people now. What about educating potential candidates? This is a business that is unlimited earnings and unlimited potential. Uh, I think you can tell by my passion that I love this business. I'm looking at people I've trained that are making six-figure income without a post-secondary education. And I'm comparing Roman's friends, for example, he's 25 years old. He's made $275,000, ladies and gentlemen, in the last four years. None of his friends that have gone to university, that have gone to college, have made that kind of income. In fact, they're paying off student loans. And I just love this industry because it gives us tremendous potential. By the way, you remember Jeff, Michael Tran? Yep. Michael Tran's at Destination Honda. I hired him, I trained him. He's now a manager going into his third year. I've now trained 15 people that start off in sales and are now managers. So I love this business and I wanna educate people to understand that this business has tremendous potential, not just for growth in terms of income, because the income will come, but managers. And we've got people in our business start off as a lot of tenants, work their way into sales, into management, and so on. So I, I want to educate, and that's why I have these career day events, because a lot of them still think that they have to be aggressive, that they have to close everybody that walks in the door. Not so. And I think the bottom line is that we have to bring more of the new people into our industry and let them know that this is not a job, it's a career. So, you know, you touched on this too, and uh, it's very true. I agree with you. The fact that, uh, you know, we're in Canada here, so post-secondary education is a lot cheaper than in the States, and some of our friends in the States uh, will certainly smile and roll their eyes at that, but they're still faced with crushing debt. And we're off, we, we provide an opportunity for people to grow. Mm -hmm. What do you think, after you're finished with them, what can the dealership do or a dealership do to coach these people towards success? Coaching, training, mentoring, support. Uh, the old days of managers sitting at a desk waiting for the deals to come, that's over. 
the managers have to buy into training, have to get involved. And it has to go from the top down. Because if they don't understand the importance of ongoing training, and again, especially with the new people, you know, the old days, 1988, you guys, it was a street smart versus book smart. I survived. And I'll tell you how I survived. I watched the pros around me. Now, today, the pros are busy. The top three guys aren't going to help the new guys coming into the business. So very important to not only hire these people, but commit to training ongoing and maybe have a platform, a regular platform. You know, I love a lot of these managers. Oh, yeah, we train all the time. I said, really, how often do you train? Oh, every Saturday morning we have a training for half an hour. Oh, that's beautiful. What are you going to learn? You know, motivation and inspiration and weekly, a weekly meetings is great. But ongoing training and have a process set up. And I understand managers are busy. And that's probably one of the hardest problems in our business is they just don't have the time. They're stressed. And quite frankly, a lot of managers don't like training because they're not very good at it, right? They hate that. Uh, Paul, I greatly appreciate uh, your input here. Obviously, we appreciate you attending. Uh, do we have anybody with questions uh, for Paul or uh, anybody here so far before we switch gears? Does Pamela, Pamela Philip, do you have any questions? Pamela? Uh, no question. I just was making a point that uh, I don't think dealers hold themselves uh, accountable enough as to mm. why that person left, why that person failed. What did mm. we do wrong? Right. How did we fail them? Because mm. uh, I think Sandy said last week that uh, even women in the industry, 98% leave. Uh, I, I, th I could be quoting that wrong, but what what do dealers have to do different to keep their people? And I don't think they're really looking at that. Mm. That's I, a great point. And, and you know, to your point, oh, is that is Sandy wants to speak? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Sandy. I'm, I'm um, patiently waiting. <laughs> well, you know, that's a great point though about women. Um, we don't have enough ladies in this business. And I can tell you, I started off in 1988. There were no women in our business. There were either business managers or receptionists or accountants. It's changed a little bit, but not as, not as much as we like to think about real estate. It's probably 50 or 55% are women. We need to get that bar raised. And so how do we bring, and maybe we can get Sandy involved. How do we bring women to our business? Like look at Tiffany. She's doing fantastic. But, you know, a lot of uh, women struggle with, oh, I don't know anything about cars. And so I don't know anything about cars, so I'm not going to make it. Well, it's not a car business. It's a people business. And women, by the way, are better listeners. They're more empathetic than men, typically, not always. And in the end, there are a lot of women in our business doing extremely well. But we have to have the opportunity to get more women in our business and understand the importance of it's not talking it's about listening and understanding the customer's needs wants and desires and that's where women are the powerhouses right to that point paul let's bring sandy in the conversation talk a little bit about women in hr but more importantly women in the auto industry mm -hmm. well hello everybody i'm really glad to be here and um there's so much to talk about <laughs> <laughs> there really is. And as far as, you know, um, the uh, women and our, and hiring, it is, I mean, it's clear to all of us that I think what it's 17 to 19% of our entire automotive staffing is female, which is a very, very, where we make up half of the population. So obviously there is a, a, a disparity there um, and we haven't quite gotten uh, to how to attract and more importantly retain um, women in, in our workplace. And I think that um, uh, it's definitely, we could do a whole show on that, I think. <laughs> So what do you what do you feel is uh, best practices in hiring staff in general, but more importantly, attracting them to the car business? Do you think? Well, 
you know, I, I love everything that Paul talked about and there were a lot of, um, and, and we're focusing on, on training, right? We're, we've got, we're acquiring people and then we dump, we give them to the dealership, right? And then they start. And I totally agree with Pamela. It becomes the dealership's responsibility. What are you going to do? Um, how are you going to help these, um, these new employees succeed? And especially if they are new to our industry, how are you going to um, really teach them about relationship uh, selling? Because I feel like that's what Paul was talking about. Like, uh, mm -hmm. I forget what you called it. Not, no more the, no more ABCs, um, uh, but NBC, NBC uh, yeah, right? Not business conversation. So to me, it's, um, it's, it's kind of, how, how are you going to continue that? And one of the ways that we can incorporate that mindset in our hiring as well is to create a place where particularly these younger generations, because I, I think it's important that we look at our younger generations. Um, I love that video, by the way, Ian, I, I thought it was, it was pretty interesting. And one of the things that she talked about in that video is that people learn differently. And she talked about it in the very beginning before she really started talking about grit, right? And finding those. And I think that that's important to recognize too. Um, our, our younger generations, and when I say younger generations, I'm talking millennials and Gen Z, which in like five years will make up 70% 70, 70 of the worldwide workforce. Mm -hmm. That's important for us to remember, right? So um, I believe. And I talked a little bit last week how I, I have this other belief um, that we as an industry should try and turn our amazing ability and acumen for customer service toward our internal customers who are our employees and our candidates and in creating a place where they want to work. So incorporating that mindset can also um, be incorporated into the kind of place with uh, a workplace that has like mentoring programs, right? We can utilize our top performers as mentors, as coaches for our new people. You know, mm. there are a lot of different ways that we, we're so creative in this industry. You know, like I, I don't think there's any cookie cutter solution for any dealer because one thing I know, and I think this spans U.S. And, and Canada, is that every dealership or dealer group is unique. You know, we've got a, everybody's using a different DMS. Somebody has a different CRM. There's going to be a different training platform. Um, you know, but making sure that people are engaged with the training um, is, is really important. Everybody hates meetings. I'm, I'm a big proponent of making it fun you know, making, making your training fun. And, um, you know, th there's a lot of different ways you can do that. So. Fantastic. <laughs> um, what, what changes do you think we need to make in order to attract and retain millennials and generation Z being that they're going to be, I think now they're about 50% of the population of America as they trend towards that 70%. Um, well, really a lot of what I just talked about is about, about that. You know about how how do we create a workplace um, in in so many different ways. You know we've uh, any more um, and really Gen X too. You know I think it's important to understand the generations and their motivations, right? Um, and what makes them tick, and and how why are they going to come and work for you? You know we all know uh, like what I was going to say about Gen X. Gen X kind of created the the whole idea of um work work life balance right only we kind of we we often and, and i think i i you know sometimes i i'm i've become used to being the unpopular um opinion uh because i am human resources which in automotive isn't really <laughs> well loved often um However, I really think that uh, I hear so much about generations, you know, the generation that comes behind us. And, and I think that it's true of every generation. We are annoyed with the one that comes behind us and annoyed that, with the one that ruined us for us in, that's coming in front. 
But what I really truly believe is that we have more in common. And when we look for those commonalities, um, then, then we'll be able to work together. But understanding what motivates the younger generations is gonna be really important. Gen Z, for example, they're very financially motivated. You know, this is a generation, this is a pre 9-11 generation. They don't know a world without uh, prior to 9-11. They are used to a world where school lockdowns are like normal. Right. Um, question from Tiago. Oh. How important is it to find a reason why find a reason why to each of the people working in a dealership. I think I got that right, Tiago. Maybe you can clarify. Wait a minute. Tiago. Yeah, it's uh, mainly people do things based on what. Uh, so what is the job? Like Paul, Paul was saying, this is not a job. It's supposed to be a career. So how important it is to find a reason why, a purpose, when you're training the people in the dealership? Tiago, I think that that is such a great question on a lot of different levels. You know, as a, a, a leader, um, what, what I'm seeing your question is, is, is helping your new employees find their personal why, right? We talk about that a lot. Like, why are you doing what you do? Why do I, you know, my why, my why, my, my first why is my daughter, right? Because I want to... Um, provide a life for her. So I work as hard as I possibly can. My second why is because I, I, why I do what I do, I want to make a difference, right? It's important to me to, to make a difference. So as a leader, I think that it is important to help people find their why. To me, that's like a, the definition of leadership and then, and then influencing them to help them achieve it. And you know what, if it, if it, ends up being not in this industry, you're still helping them. You are mm -hmm. still being a leader, you know? So I think that's such a great question. And so I think it's super important actually. Thank you for the question, Tiago. Uh, just a really quick comment, Sandy, as well, just to kind of uh, flow through if you don't mind is, if, if, if some dealerships are still thinking about what they're gonna do with the millennials, they've almost missed the boat. Yes. Because the oldest millennial is almost 40 years old now. Right. And there's a whole other generation coming. And if you're just trying to figure out how to train your 40 year olds now, um, you might want to skip and get moving on because we've been preaching the millennial story for so long, we almost missed it. Um, because it is true. All these generations think so differently. And the millennials are older than we think. But anyway, good seeing you again this morning. Uh, you too, you too, Barry. And I think that that is um, a really astute comment and, and very, very true. You know, there's a, um, there's a quote that uh, I, I often use and it's funny because it talks about, you know, you think that the quote is talking about millennials, right? It's a whiny, it's a whiny generation and, you know, come on, work hard and get out of your parents' basement and, and you know, get into the world. And um, I've never played or talked or, or, you know, recited this quote without people thinking that it's about millennials, when in actuality, it was written in 1993. It's a Newsweek article from 1993 that was written about Generation X. You know, so we have these, these preconceived notions. Um, and, and, you know, I think I said last week, I feel like our industry, if we're gonna, we need to be and become the top choice for the top talent, which actually there is something I wanted to say, you know, Paul, everything Paul talked about, he brings these, these great candidates, right? And, and then it's up to the managers, the hiring managers to interview them. And, and I think that that is also a piece that we often miss. We don't train our managers how to really interview a candidate, how to get down to the, you know, it, I, it's called behavioral interviewing. And in some industries, you know, that's passe, but it's my belief that behavioral interviewing for our industry is, is where it needs to be. Asking, digging deeper, and also looking for those, those things that you, you can't teach. You know, I mean, just ask yourself how many of your managers actually do the following things. 
do they prepare at take at least 10, 10, 15 minutes and prepare for each interview? Do they look at the resume, figure out what questions they are going to ask this candidate that's coming in? Um, you know, do they do those two things? Because if they don't, uh, it's possible that you need some training for your managers to help them be able to identify the best candidates for your store. So I have a question from, uh, from Pamela. What do you mean by digging deeper? Maybe you can give us an example. Sure. Um, by digging deeper, you know, behavioral interviewing is, starts with a question like, tell me about a time. You know, when you are asking questions like that, that are, a candidate can give um, a yes, no answer. Um, and even when they give an answer, ask some more. Well, tell me about how, what that looked like. Like, you know, <clears throat> if, uh, if somebody gives you, ask the, the who, when, why, where, and most especially, tell me what you learned. You know, one of my, um, and I, I'm a big proponent. I like to have a knockout question when I'm, when I'm interviewing people. And what I mean by that is a question that um, is really like a make or break one for me. And for me, my personal one is tell me about a time you made a mistake. And if the answer is, you know what I did, I, I can't think of a time I made a mistake. Um, then I pretty much they're, they, they've gone down in my, in my estimation of how good they're going to do at the job because, and then when they tell me about a, a mistake that they made, I want to know how they fixed it and what they learned from it. You know, so that's what I, does that answer the question, Pamela? Thank you for the, for the question. The, what I mean by digging deeper. Um, one thing yes, that was, that was great. Thank you. Sorry. I, I want to make a point, Ian, if I can, and Jeff about millennials, if you don't mind. So I asked my 25 year old son, Roman, to give me a definition of some of his friends and some of his motivated friends. So I don't even want to talk about millennials. I just want to talk about his, the people in his age group. And so here's what he wrote. Some of my millennial friends believe everything they desire will come to them instead of working hard for it. Some of my millennial friends think their natural intelligence will get them into a workplace without any effort. And they don't have a lack of, or they have a lack of drive or ambition. Then he wrote, some of my motivated millennial friends never satisfied with where they are at and they believe they can accomplish more. Willing to put in the extra hours and efforts to hit their targets and always willing to learn and accept the reality that they don't know everything yet in their respected field. So to me, it's a mindset. And maybe sometimes we have to forget about, like we talked about the millennials are now up to 39 or 40 years old. Maybe it's just the individual themselves. And how do we get these people motivated? How do we get them drive and ambition and what gets them going? Where do they want to be? And how do they want to get there? And I, I've always taught Roman right from the ground up, it's going to take you four years to be a sales professional. It's not going to happen overnight. But if they put the time and effort in, they'll get there. And so I thought I'd share that with you because some of his friends are doing really great. And some of his friends are sitting at home, vaping, watching Xbox, and they don't care, <laughs> right? Here, here, here's right? where here's where Paul and I are. While Paul and I like the first conversation we had lasted two hours long, but here's where I'm going to go back to avoiding um, putting generalizations on an entire generation, because right. um, I think that that can just be attributed to people. Some That's people, right. um, in in just in general, you know. So if we're hiring some of those people. It's up to us mm -hmm. to help to motivate them, to find out what their motivations are and help them be successful. And it is true, you know, it, NADA here says, um, you know, it takes three years for uh, a salesperson to reach their highest potential. 
yet mm -hmm. across the board um, turnover in sales is the average tenure is below three years. So what are we doing wrong? It's not them. <laughs> it's, it's us. No, it's, it, to, to, to back you up on that, Sandy, I think one of the things that we as leaders need to realize is what are their personal goals? Because their personal goals aren't my goals. If you've got somebody who's never taken their family on a vacation, on a tropical vacation, and you tell them, look, you hit these three markers and you do it in this timeline, I'll pay for half the trip. Or somebody's getting married and you say, you know what, if you hit these markers, if you sell your 120 cars like we've targeted you this year, tell you what, I'm buying your wedding dress. Whatever, the, what, whatever it is, make it relevant to them and you will be blown away how they step up to the plate and yeah. because you now have a shared goal. It's not about the owner getting a new boat. And it's not about him driving a nicer car. It's their goal and you you back them up. You know, right. earlier in the conversation, you just said shared goal. And I think that, and earlier in the conversation, there was some talk about our uh, culture and about how it's often cutthroat um, and, and we're not often helping each other. And I had a conversation yesterday with a sales uh, person who is living in that kind of a culture where it's, you know, the top salespeople are over the shoulder of the newer salespeople as instead of lifting them up, right? They're, <laughs> and, and I think that if we look, because what's important is um, the, the, the dealership, right? And the success of the dealership as a whole. And when you can create a, a, a culture where all employees have that goal in mind, right? Then, then, you can, then you can work together. And, you know, maybe some people think I live in Fru Fru land, but I've, I've actually, like, I've seen that work. I've seen that um, actually happen. And um, it's, it's pretty amazing. It, it, can be, it can be pretty amazing. And I think that this industry is pretty amazing. And if any industry can, can do that, I think it's automotive. I, really I, I think one of the struggles we always say, sorry, go ahead. You know, a question from Pamela. We've each measured success in different ways. I believe we have to figure out what measure is for each person. I think that's a great point, but go ahead, Bernie. It's, it's true. So, it's, I was just going to comment that Sandy just on what you were saying is so many times, if you go into a established dealership, you're probably going to find a 50 year old guy running the floor from his desk on the sales floor, not the sales manager or the GSM or anybody actually truly running the floor. You'll leave a session of training and they'll all gather around his desk and he will tell everybody how you don't need to listen to them. Here's how we're gonna do it. Here's how it's gonna happen. And I think that's the, that is the root of all of it. If we don't change that, we will never, ever, ever change anything. Because just as soon as that person retires, leaves, whatever, that someone else slides into, into that position. And, and we always have that, 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 that I don't wanna call it a cancer, but that, that eating away at what we're trying to accomplish and, and never really getting the movement that we think we're going to. So, you know, I'm sure Paul sees it every time he goes into a dealership. He's like, well, first of all, get rid of that guy. And then you have your problems fixed. <laughs> we'll solve it all moving forward. I was trying to get rid of one of the salesmen that was selling three cars a month. He'd been there 10 years. So I was doing some consulting with this dealership. So I went to the owner. I said, why is this fellow still here? He sells three cars a month. He's been here 10 years. You know what his answer was? Well, he brings me Starbucks in the morning. He brings me Starbucks in the morning. And I said to the gentleman, I will bring you Starbucks. Unless he takes my training course and we get him back to square one because he's doing everything wrong. I see it. Because what happens in our business, guys, is we all know, you know, we hit that burnout mark. And usually it can happen around the five or six years. It's a tough business. You know, you're dealing with a lot of stress in our business, all about the numbers. And you've seen, you know, the up and down curve with some of these people that aren't sticking with the process. And we all know what happens. And I know Jeff and I have talked about this a million times. They fall off the wagon. And now they think that they can do everything by taking the shortcuts. Well, shortcuts equals pay cuts. And the one thing I have to emphasize with my training is get back to the basics and stick with the basics because it works. I didn't invent the trail to the sale. We didn't invent the sales cycle, but guess what? The legend 
whoever created this thing is genius. It's so simple, but they fall off it because they think they know better. And like you were just mentioning, these pros, now they're teaching these guys, yeah, no, you don't have to go on test drives. You don't have to do a presentation. Just cut to the chase and sell them a car. Well, it may work for him, but it may not work for these new people. And so that's part of the poison that you're talking about on the sales floor today, right? Well, there, you know, I, I'm going to jump in here because there is another kind of poison that, mm. um, that I, I see often. And it was in the conversation. There's bad behavior that happens to our top performers, with our top performers, right? And we ignore, we often ignore behaviors that really don't, um, are not in line oftentimes with our employment laws. And also uh, with the idea of the highest and the best for the dealership as a whole. So that's another thing that I, I, I mean, I think we're, we're lying to ourselves if you say that it doesn't happen, um, you know, where there's bad behavior that will be accepted because that person sells 35 cars a month. And you know, I, I do want to bring up a point here that you made too. Um, is the, you mentioned this a while ago and then uh, Paul touched on this and a lot of the challenges, you tell me what you think, but I think people who've been doing this a long time, the, the, the 50 year old guy with the 55 year old manager in the background um, with these new people coming in, you mentioned work-life balance. And then Paul said, putting the hours in. Okay. Well, that is, I'm really glad you brought that up, Jeff, because it is a, um, a thing. I don't think people in general want to work bell to bell anymore. Um, you know, there are actually Paul and I had had a bit of a conversation about this that at some point, um, perhaps someone who's just getting going in their, uh, you know, in their career in sales is putting in all the hours and is willing to sacrifice having a family. Um, and, you know, I think we all agree that, uh, you know, we spend more time at work, even if you work just 40 hours a week, you spend more time during the day with the people that you work with than you do with the most important people in your life, you know? So, and I think that, that, you know, millennials in particular, even though, though, like I said earlier, Gen X kind of invented work-life balance, that the whole idea of it, uh, millennials and Gen Z um, are very, very cognizant of that. Not only that, they know how to, you know, we hear this work smarter, not harder. They know how to do that. They know how to take the technology available to us and work smarter and do the, get, get the same amount done in a different way. And I think that that's important to, to remember one big difference with Gen Z, for example, I have a Gen Z daughter. I will never forget the day that she had headphones on like me listening to music was sitting there doing her homework. And I was like, what are you doing? How, how can you concentrate? The yeah. kid got straight A's. I mean, like yeah. she, <laughs> so once I got over myself that she does things differently than me um, and succeeds even better than I did, you know? So they are, we need to let them be who they are and give them ways. One thing I talked about with, with training, finding new ways to make it engaging and that, that uh, the learning actually happens um, I, one way that I love to try and do that is through gaming, right? You can, I, I'm a big proponent of bite-sized training in small little pieces. Cause who likes a meeting? Nobody. I don't know anybody that's, it's, well, HR people, we'd like to go in and like, yay, let's, let me, teach me something. Um, but, but learning really can happen uh, if you find a way to make it fun, uh, make it competitive with a leaderboard even. Anyway, there, there's a lot of things that, that we can do. Well, and if you're not making those changes, what you're, what you're going to have is back when we were talking about the 70s and joking a little bit earlier. Back then, we were like the, the pay structure is based on the people we were hiring. They would get out of jail. We would hire them because we didn't <laughs> care. And the police car would drive through the lot and all the salespeople would disappear. 
and then they would go away for a while and then they'd come back and then hammer out 50 cars and then they'd go blow their paycheck and, and disappear for a week but we'd they'd sell cars we'd bring them back and we're still dealing with that pay structure that environment trying to attract millennials and younger and it's never going to work unless you figure it out the, yeah, the, the two the two collide head on yeah barry that that the point of pay plans is i think is a really um poignant and and very important thing for us to remember i mean there are some dealers and it depends on your area you know i, I know I think, some i think one of the things sandy sorry to cut you off but i think okay. one of the things that we suffer in our industry is our pay plan is built around a personality type not mm -hmm. what your plumbing is right. and, and we're trying it's not necessarily what? built around the the younger generation's wants anymore no and it because the unpredictability of it in today's world our bills are so predictable and our income is unpredictable. It just, there are three personality types that don't like that. And we need to, we need to make it so it's safer and we could pay our people half as much, but guarantee them that income. And we would attract all four personality types. And, and I think uh, to be successful, the modern dealership needs to almost have, here's your introductory pay. Once you've reached 80 cars a year, this is how we'll change it. Once you've reached 120 cars a year, this is how we'll change it. We'll reward you for your work. And once right. you get to the point, you're pumping out a buck 50, everybody's good. You're on 25% commission. Now your, your wife's not beating you up. Your husband's not beating you up. How come you don't know how much money you're going to make? We can't even buy a car because I don't know how good November is going to be. All these things that fight us when they go home. Yep. So. And, and in between there, Add in, now you'll be a mentor to the people who are coming behind you. You know, uh, there, there's a saying in, that a dear friend of mine says, you know, if, if I have one hand on, in front of me holding on to the person who came before and I've got another hand back here bringing the person who's coming after me, I don't have any hand to do any stupid, crazy stuff, right? So yeah. anyway, yeah. No, <laughs> it's I, another I, way to create career paths, what you just talked about, Barry. No, mean to cut you off, but out of respect for time, it is nine o'clock, and we try to keep the meeting to an hour. Another great conversation. And of course, uh, on autohubclub.com, you can check out the new website, watch past episodes, check out short clips, and obviously follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Any ideas? We're all ears. Thanks for another great session. Thanks, everybody. Thank Have you, good. everybody. Good to see Thank you all you. again. Bye now. Bye bye. 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 Ian, do you want to stay on for a sec? Sure. Oh. I left. And Jeff. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. Am I still here? Yeah, no. you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, John. Hi. Hey, John. What's going on? I, I thought that was great, Listen, guys. I'll, uh, I'll let you guys continue. All and, right. Uh, I'll escape the meeting for now. All right. Thanks for coming. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So Ian totally thought about my friend Katie. Oh, I met I met her at uh, NADA this year. Yeah, Katie's pretty awesome. Oh, we were probably I mean I I, of I was like her uh, we won an award for Nab that so she was there at the award ceremony I think. Oh, I did you? And another person really is um another vendor who on this whole same idea would be Automoto HR, Stephen Warner. I, I can know. introduce you to both of them. Actually. Yeah, just go ahead and do that. And I'm okay. happy to, I mean, we're obviously going to be doing more shows, so, you know, happy to have um, guests and if there are yeah. anything else that's... Um, Stephen has a applicant tracking, uh, really, uh, a, it's more of a management system. Okay. Um, that also happens to have an applicant tracking and and it, it works in Canada too like when okay. you you choose um, so that might be good for you so I'll introduce you to Katie who is what what made me think of her so that Jeff and and Paul know is when we when the conversation turned toward uh, women in automotive yeah, I mean, there's there's yeah. also another great lady. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she's. I think it, uh, I'm I'm gonna have her on. She has a call center company called the Car Girls. So she actually has her own company that's all women, just uh, just working with car dealers. But the company's called the Car Girls. Her name is Janice Showers. I've known her for years. Yeah, I don't know her. It's called yeah. what? The Car Girls. 
I'll introduce you to her. She's she's fantastic, but her whole focus is women calling customers. So all of her staff is women. She's a female in business. So she's, she's like, like an outsourced BDC? Yeah, it's like outsourced BDC. Yeah, that's what she does. But she, Yeah, I mean, like, that's cool. I feel like women get stuck in BDC. And I understand. Like, th that's all we can do, honestly, is, is well, the whole... Yeah, but she does more than that. But that's, that's I, her thing. <laughs> Uh, but there's also another girl out in Toronto, and she does um, she does I think events at dealerships for new for for uh, new owners, but based on from a female perspective. Okay, well, it's possible that Katie might be able to add her perspective because Katie's yeah. research is really about customer experience. What she okay. is is a customer experience expert. Oh, okay, and you know, I, did you hear her talk at NADA? Uh -huh. No, I didn't. I was at okay. working a booth, so I didn't hear anybody. <laughs> okay, she, um, I mean, she, she's pretty amazing, and um, it, it's it, her mess. Her, her research is very important for dealers, you know. Like, and and it can add to. It's not just about how we treat our uh, female customers, because that's why she started doing this in automotive. I mean, she was a trainer for Celebrity um, Cruise Line. I mean, like, she was their top inspiration officer yeah. and you know her own experience walking into a car dealership and how she was treated is what made her come to automotive she had to go to seven before they said where before somebody didn't say where's your husband yeah i mean I'm, I'm, you're familiar with the owner or the former manager owner of fiat of austin say that again uh the former manager owner of fiat of austin she she was one of the first women to not only build a sales force around women, um, she also was the first, I think, to sell over 150, I think it was 150 or 200 Fiat's in a month. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, is, is a yeah. lot. <laughs> you know, I, I, as far as really and truly, and I think that as, as we move forward, as far as, because generations, the younger generations don't see, they're so diverse that they don't even know what we're talking about when, when it's about oh, yeah. Diversity. So, if I mean, we apply like all the things outside, that we talk about to trying women outside of the industry, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you because I was in the in the middle of a sentence. Yeah, so her whole idea was hire women outside of the industry. Uh, you know, train them in a different way. It's female first. I mean, she was very progressive. I don't know if she's in the industry anymore, but uh, she, she, I'm sure she was a speaker at NBA. She's been active for a long time. But uh, she ha again had a, a really different attitude towards retail, and you know, very interesting too from the same point of view. She was like, just throw out the historic stuff and start from scratch. Make it about experience. I'm going to hire people that work in malls and people work in whatever, and I'm just going to train them in a different way. And and you know, was very successful at it um, with a brand that was new to the U.S. And you know, uh, I really, in my opinion, just sort of recreated what retail could be, which I think is what uh, Tesla rightly or wrongly, and I've been studying them for years, did, which is like, we don't need a car person. We need someone who can interact with a customer in front of a computer screen for the most part. I mean, there's not a lot of what I consider a traditional process there um, to the point where, I mean, I think the only piece of paper there was when you go on a test bed. Everything else is digital. There is no paper. So it's, it's kind of interesting to look at these different models, but uh, yeah, I definitely, I'm always interested in having people with different opinions because customer experience to me is the future of all retail, not just auto. If you're not looking at that and you're not training people that way. I'll send you an email introducing you to okay. Katie and, and Stephen Warner. Yeah, and I'll dig up those two people. I mean, Janice is fantastic. She's gonna be on a show at the end of the month. I'm gonna have a show on call centers. So like outsource versus PDC. Mm -hmm. And I'm also doing a marketing show. Uh, I'm going to have Barry on it, I, I believe. Um, and he's going to talk about customer experience, multiple touch points. And then I'm going to have the gentleman in charge of autos for Kijiji Auto okay. on uh, to talk about how eBay helps dealers with auto. I've still got to go through the PR thing, but I think it's okay, all. Okay, cool. And the other thing about Katie, she's in Canada. Yeah, I, I met her at the show. I, I, I'm almost positive I sent her a request, but I, I, I saw some posts from her that was interesting. And I did meet her at that event. I was, you know, 
Yeah, Stephen Warner actually won. I was kind of not really mingling. Hey guys, I gotta, I gotta sign off. Oh well, yeah, I gotta go too. We'll be in touch. Paul, okay. see you again. Thanks, Paul, it's great to see you again. Thanks for Good everything. Thanks, we'll be Jeff, really Bye. nice to meet you. Pleasure's all mine. Thanks. Have a happy day. All right, you too. Take care.